Thank you, Dominique, for this nice uh, presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, good to be uh, back again. And uh, with three very nice, interesting, and diverse uh, gentlemen. <laughs> um, uh, in a moment of our digital developments where things are going very quickly and topsy-turvy, uh, a moment where something to build walls, when the digital economy is borderless, when uh, Europe uh, seems to lag behind, but when I see the Digital Economy and Society Index, actually worldwide it is the top European countries, which are the top world countries, speaking uh, about um, Iceland, uh, speaking about Korea and speaking about the United States. They come behind Denmark, Netherlands, Sweden and Finland. But then when you take the European average, we are lagging behind again. So very many questions uh, to ask and I would like uh, to start with the youngest among you, uh, Mark Alhamis, who uh, is from I don't know if I pronounce well, Mark. Perfect. Uh, perfect. Well, it is a very original company, actually. And uh, when I was hearing uh, just before um, the uh, panel speaking about uh, that um, uh, privacy is not only a fashion in Europe, but it is a fundamental right, then there we got a company which has taken that serious, which has developed a data browser search and with a built-in anti-truck technology. Very original. So Mark, how does it work? Who are your customers and how do you want to bring this European way of seeing things, of having the free flow of data and the privacy in equilibration? How do you want that to be achieved? Thank, Thank you very much. Uh, I probably couldn't explain it better than you just did. Um, we, we really took search to a new level with the luxury of starting 20 years late, if you so want. And we built search directly into the browser. Um, I think it's called edge computing, if you want a fancy term. So a lot of the machine learning is really happening at, at the edge directly at the client. And this way, you can navigate directly out of your browser. Um, it does look like search like you're used to. It doesn't have the 10 links on one page. It is really directly in the browser, and it's much faster. And by bringing it into the browser, it's not only faster, it's, it's incredibly private. We actually don't have a concept of a user profile. So if we would be, to ha if we would be hacked tomorrow, all our servers, which are, by the way, on Amazon, um, thanks for that, um, I, I could still sleep, because there is no profile that could get lost. But on the other hand, we innovated and built search, so we are dependent on big data. And I think this is a very European thing. Uh, we, we didn't say, look, data is a bad thing. Uh, we should stop it to, to get privacy. We should all wear tinfoil around our head. We very much believe in data, but we don't believe in personal data. And that's the clicks concept um, that we brought to the market. In the, um, uh, in the discussion uh, this, at the end of the morning, there were Christopher Schlöffler from Wimpel and Jürgen Schmidhuber from Itzia, who said that uh, the future would be that you choose to whom you hand on your personal data. Not that you do not hand it out, but that it becomes a trusted partnership and that it becomes a transactional agreement. So is that somehow what you have in mind? Um. Yes and no, we are probably even stronger in our case, the data is not going out at all, but there are circumstances where you want to send your data and then this concept might make sense. But, but if we talk about Europe, and, and I was listening to this panel, I'm, I'm less optimistic about it uh, th than this panel was, because the question is, 
does Europe finally decide to participate in these games? Um, and so far, you, you mentioned these indexes of, of where Europe, some individual countries are. But if you really look at the value chain today, um, Europe is very, very strong at the very beginning. So uh, digging holes and putting wires into the ground. We are also extremely strong when you look at the app and the content part. But everything in between is really colonized. Um, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. I'm, I'm the youngest on this panel. I'm grown up in a world, in a very benevolent world, where geopolitics really didn't play a role. Um, and, and the US, who is dominating all the value chain pieces from search uh, over social, um, over ranking algorithms, it's not really a problem that all these companies are sitting in, in a different country. But I think with Brexit, with the recent elections, we have to question that again. And um, I've seen news this morning about um, ranking again affecting maybe the election we have this year. And politics can only regulate while technology can create. And my core question is, when does Europe stand up? And that's more a question for the entrepreneurs and, and decide to participate at this really core problems, operating systems, search, social. Well, you have already started to speak about uh, the dossier of Willem Juncker, uh, because he is the CEO of uh, EIT um, Digital, and uh, he predicts that in the next 10 years, uh, digital will not anymore support business, but digital will become business. So it will be the whole business. And there he also says that uh, in this world, unfortunately, uh, Europe uh, is not anywhere uh, when it comes to the infrastructure. It is the United States who are the major players there. Now, having uh, heard that, nevertheless, the, there are four European uh, countries leading the crowd worldwide. Why is it so that we are so strong in some ways and so feeble in others? Thanks very much for that question. Let me first say a few words about our organization because I don't think it's as well known as Amazon yet. So let's do a check maybe. So EIT stands for the European Institute of Innovation and Technology. It was set up uh, around eight years ago and our organization is the digital arm of the EIT. There is also five other arms that cover topics like climate, energy, raw materials, health and food. Our mission is to drive digital entrepreneurship in Europe. And we do that through a combination of innovation activities and education activities. So we support ventures for European growth and make sure they overcome the hurdles of the fragmented European market, but also the fragmented European financing. On the other hand, we run a couple of education programs, which we do in a modern format in the way that we combine entrepreneurial skills with technical skills, and we combine online learning also with the in-class classroom learning. So that's, that's roughly what we do. Most recently, I'm just back from this far advanced country, Silicon Valley, because we have an office in San Francisco uh, for two years now. Uh, and I talked with uh, our uh, partners, Coursera. Coursera drives online education. And they just reported to me that our first course, our MOOC that we uh, launched in the summer on their platform, just reached 30,000 online learners, which I think is a big achievement for an organization that is just taking off. So uh, the education is absolutely indispensable and you are right because only 45% of the Europeans are uh, digital, uh, uh, have a digital capacity. So there is a lot of room uh, in there. Uh, but you have written that 90% of the future jobs will uh, require digital skills. So from 45% to 90%, that's a doubling. How do you think that we can uh, keep uh, the um, speed in order to educate at least the young generation, if not also to have the professional training for all those who are going to lose their jobs with the new developments. Uh, where can Europe do what in order to uh, keep up with the developments here? Yeah, so I think lifelong education is, is a very, very important topic. I'm not so much concerned about the youngsters, to be honest. I think they, they pick it up very uh, easily. I think the main concern is that the digital transformation is not 
going to be an inclusive transformation, that we will have too many people that cannot uh, catch up. So that's why we heavily invest in lifelong learning, online learning, so we have a large reach, yeah, because our online master school reaches a thousand people. Our our, our on, on uh, campus master school reaches a thousand people. Our online reaches 30,000 people. So that's for us a very important instrument to drive that continuous education of professionals that should indeed make this transition and make sure that we have an inclusive transition. We target mainly, let's say, the people that were, were confronted with a very fast development of digital transformation. We had something about the cars, so I think the car industry is in the middle of the disruptive storm today. And you can actually ask yourself, in five years, will a car need more energy to process its data or to get it driving? That, that sounds fine. But nevertheless, what do we do um, with the cashiers? What do we do with the um, uh, blue-collar uh, collar jobs which are going to disappear? How can we give to those people not only a decent living? Uh, I think you could think about putting uh, on, um, um, uh, on machines uh, a taxation, for instance, but then still those people will be without any job, without any contribution. How do we need to change our society so that the digital world and the social world, the societal world, uh, are not in discrepancy. Yeah, I think there are a couple of ways to do it. So first, I'm not so pessimistic that everybody all of a sudden will be out of a job. I think that there will be a gradual transition from doing the work to supervising the work. And that will give us time to phase out certain jobs and do that in a social respectable way. The other way is about wealth distribution. What you currently see is that the uh, internet uh, platforms allow uh, fast development of monopolies, which comes along with large aggregation of wealth. And if you do not tax that wealth in the right way and redistribute it in the society, you will run into issues. It's a big debate in, in Europe all these kind of tax constructions you have. So I think what we have to do is to make sure that all of us are responsible. And that's how we also train our young entrepreneurs. This is not just for you aggregating a monopoly. This is for you being in a favorite position. But please give back to society and make sure that we do not get pockets of wealth while the rest is not really taken care of very well. Well, we have so far heard uh, the European point of view and uh, the point of view of somebody who likes to put the European way of looking at things. Uh, for instance, putting together um, the, um, the free flow of data with the data uh, protection. Uh, now uh, I am um, turning to Werner Vogels from Amazon. He's the CFO of Amazon. And uh, Amazon is a worldwide company, very strong on all the continents. Um, and how do you combine these different ways? The US way, which means free flow without data protection, the European way, which means free flow with data protection, and the Chinese uh, way, which means means no flow, no protection, but a wall. Uh, I simplify. I simplify terribly. But for a worldwide operating company, that must be a nightmare. No, actually not at all. It's because you can set yourself values and norms that are way above that. Yeah, for us, protecting our customers will be forever our number one priority. That means regardless where your customers are, whether they're in Europe, whether they're in the US, whether they're in China, uh, your first and foremost priority as a business at all times is to protect your customers. If you want to build a long-term customer-centric business, the only thing you can do is align yourself with your customers, protect them at all costs. I find that most regulations are just, in my eyes, it's just a minimum base. Now, it's just the limited, necessary, sufficient kind of starting point. If we really want to protect our customers, we need to make sure that you encrypt all personal identifiable information, that you manage all your keys, that customers are the ones that are in charge of all of this. Yeah, and so, of course, well, most customers know, of course, Amazon as, as our e-commerce company, we're the pioneer in cloud computing. Yeah, I mean, the, the fastest growing IT company to hit $10 billion. Yeah, $13 billion run rate at the moment, growing 55% year over year. Yeah, so, 
We have millions of businesses running on our platform world, worldwide. We could only do that if we really make protection of our customers our number one priority, regardless of the locales where they operate in. And these days, I mean, digital is a worldwide business. Yeah, I mean, every company here in Germany that is getting created, I mean, if you build clicks, you don't build it just for the European market, or not just for the German market. You build it for a worldwide market. I mean, maybe even, I mean, we have quite a few people from Israel here. Um, Israel is a hotbed of startups, of new technology. None of the Israeli startups build it for the Israeli market. Everybody builds it for a global market. You need to be able to function in a global space, but still know that you can have total control over your data and that you're the only one there. Um, a, a point actually that is much closer to my heart when we get actually to uh, talking about Europe and European data flow is uh, actually what many of my customers are faced with on a cloud computing platform. Uh, if you look at how digital services are consumed at this moment here in Europe, 44% are within one country. 54% are consumed from the US. There's only, I think it's only 4% of services that are actually cross-border within Europe. Yeah, there is hardly any cross-border sort of services being delivered in Europe. Yeah, there's a very strong nationalist-centric uh, approach still. Um, I think every healthy economy has a very healthy SME, a small and medium business, which is Middelstand here in Germany. Yeah. If you look at the Middelstand in Germany, only 7% of them actually is capable of doing cross-border mm -hmm. sort of e-commerce. And why? Because the regulations are just way too hard. It is way too hard for a customer in Germany to actually buy something from a German company. Uh, of, the, of those SMEs in Germany, well over 60% would like to do cross Europe uh, e-commerce. It's just way too hard and way too costly for them. Just doing VAT in another country will cost you 5,000 euros a year. Imagine you want to do that in 20 countries. It costs you 100,000 euros. Yeah, this is impossible for small businesses to do. There are so many things we need to fix at a practical level, such that small and medium businesses can operate throughout Europe with free flow of data, so that if you actually are building a company here in Germany, yeah, and you want to sell to customers in France, that you can store your data of French customers here in Germany, that you don't have to actually worry about setting operations in France, or in the Netherlands, or in the UK, or in Denmark. Yeah, I mean, that, that free flow of data is crucial to building a very healthy economy where small and medium businesses can thrive in. Werner is absolutely right uh, on this, and you know, uh, I tried to make <laughs> a pan-European um, uh, contract law. Yeah. Uh, where you would have the same rules on the whole continent uh, for selling, but also the same protection of the consumers um, Europe-wide. That would have been the possibility. Well, it was mainly blocked by Germany, I must tell you. Yeah, so uh, uh, similar yeah. to, to that, for example, I think the, the recent attempt by ANSIP and, 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 his, and other commissioners to actually get free flow of data actually moved through. Now it's becoming a consultation. I think it's going out to the parliament, to the uh, larger public. It's gone out two days ago, three days ago. Uh, it's crucial that we get to fix this because without this, there is no European digital economy. There will be 27 individual economies that will all be hampered by walls that have been built around it. Uh, and so we see much of this happening throughout Europe. The French government, unfortunately, has made every communication with the French uh, government uh, emails a national document, which means that they have to be stored within, the, uh, within France. Yeah, that means that any, any communication that you have outside France, actually, um, you can no longer use any international services for that. So there's so much to fix. I think. Um, Maybe I may add something to this, yeah. because I think this is absolutely true. On the other hand, I mean, uh, uh, this is the same for an uh, American company that wants to conquer Europe as a European country that wants to conquer Europe, right? So, so I think there's also a, a, a mindset and mentality uh, issue here and a cultural issue. And I think, uh, I, I mean, what we should address is really the mindset. The mindset in oh, Europe absolutely. is very, very local, very national. 
indeed, and that results also to a translation of that national mindset into the digital world, which sure. by definition is global. So I think that's the core issue. Unfortunately, I look, if, I, if you look at what's currently going on, the hopes are not that high because there is even more this feeling of, hey, we have to go back between, behind the walls to protect ourselves of what's, what's, what's rolling over us. So the, the, the main challenge now is how do we now swap it? Because what happens is the big guys are able to do it. As a result, the smaller guys do not get room to, to expand and to grow. And as a result, everybody becomes more protective rather than opening up because seeing that as the core is. So what, what do sure. we do here? Actually, and in that sense, I want to come back to something that Vivian asked yeah. you earlier. So what is really the difference between US companies and European companies? Yeah. Um, I, I, one of the major things that is different is the R&D investment in IT. I mean, um, the R&D made by European companies is a fraction of what American companies spend on IT-driven R&D. Yep. And as such, you will see many new services coming out of your American companies, mostly pure as a result of the amount of investment in IT-driven R&D. Yep. And until you get data to the same level, you know, you will not see, even in the longer term, that yep. kind of sort of results coming out of Europe where these services are good, yep. which means that um, for the foreseeable future, most of these innovative new services will be coming out of the US, yep. will be coming out of Israel, yep. will be coming out of Southeast Asia, because those kind of investments are being made there. Yes. Let's come back to the basis of this question, because we have, both of you have said very clearly that it is thinking small, small. Uh, which brings uh, to uh, these uh, um, divisions which are still existing on what could be a huge market. Now, the European Commission has started to make some laws which cover the whole uh, of the market and eliminate national laws. That's the only way uh, to proceed, by the way. Uh, but coming back to this, when we see the trends worldwide in this moment, we see that uh, there is a risk of escalating national political protectionism, which leads then also to industrial protectionism. And it is worse in the United States in this moment. I would like to ask you why you create 100,000 uh, jobs in the US? Was that an answer to no. uh, the new uh, <laughs> to <laughs> president? It's because it's one of the areas where we grow really fast. Uh, actually, we created 10,000 jobs in Europe last year. Yeah, Excellent. if you I just talked to a, ger a gentleman over there from Poland, um, our, our uh, situations in Poland, our, our uh, fulfillment centers in Poland actually were the ones that drove one million package shipment a day during Christmas. So uh, we made major investments here in Europe, both uh, in terms of sort of uh, fulfillment centers as well as in high tech jobs. Um, we have hundreds of jobs open here in Germany. Anybody wants to come work for us? Yeah. Uh, jobs.amazon.com, just to, uh, to uh, we have thousands of openings here in, in Europe. It's just that uh, we made this sort of push in the, in the US um, for where we see major growth happening. Now, I, to come, uh, to, to, to turn away from Amazon, because uh, I, I would like to come to the general question. And I think it is an, an important one, because if we see this protectionism rising everywhere, and you hear it in politics around the globe, uh, isn't there a danger that this political protectionism leads to industrial protectionism? Well, if the new warfare is cyber, the answer could be to build their own protected local technology and systems. What can the uh, companies, the worldwide operating companies, the internet um, uh, industry, which is by definition a worldwide one, what can it do in order to unite forces, in order not to leave this protectionism take over? Uh, I think you wanted also to come in here. Yeah, I could say a few words about that because I, I think that you're exactly right. I mean, this protectionism will not really... I, I, at the same time, I would like to look a little bit back in history. I mean, when we had the last industrial revolution, we saw similar things going on that we had now. I mean, in the 17th century, a, work, a craftsman could make a proper living. Then we had the factories, and when you were working in a factory, you could not make a pro proper living. Yeah, so, and 25% and of the population was living in pure poverty in the industrialized world. 
And we see same things coming in now. What was the response actually? The response was actually making democracy work. That was the answer. Torbeke in the Netherlands rewrote the constitution and made democracy work. And I think that that is the main challenge. And I think that that's not exactly going right today. Because we say the internet empowers everybody. And at the same time, we see that there is a big skepticism whether the internet really empowers everybody. Does the internet empower the first mover, which was able to build a monopoly and control the whole search space, not to name any names? Or is it to the benefit of the individual that really wants to know objective information and has this now in his uh, cell phone? Mark, you want to give power back to the consumers. Uh, would that be an answer maybe uh, against these building walls uh, strategies? Um, yes and no. And, and I, I want to go back to the question whether walls are always a bad thing. So I, I don't want walls, but I want to have choice for the users. And um, I was listening this morning to, to the BMW panel where the core question was, if you want to really build a safe autonomous car, maps are key. And I think the German car industry just invested into here. And then came the, the short side note. Um, you actually need crowdsourced data to improve your maps. Well, that's, that's an uphill battle already because you're competing with one company that has around 2 billion devices running around across all streets all day. Android and Apple has the same collecting this data constantly. So if you want to build, if, if your mission would be to build the best map in the world, you have already lost because two billion people are working against you. And, and that question, we, we should slightly challenge whether we will always lag behind. The second thing is, the, the last thing I want to have is, is walls, but there should, be, there should be choice. And at the moment, we, we have no choice, at least in Europe. There is no there is no internet business model that is actually in line with our society's build. You yourself said a couple of years ago at DLD stage, the difference between the US and, and, and Europe is, in the US, if something uh, is not forbidden, it is allowed. In Europe, it's the other way around. If it's not allowed, it's forbidden. And this is actually what citizens and what our users expect. Users have no idea how the internet works. They think the laws and the rules of our society apply if they use the internet in Germany. But this is not true. Because Mark, now allow us, because we need to, to finish. But I would like to finish not with a problem, but with a dream. <laughs> okay. And I know I have a big dream, and, and let me say this. I have a big dream that uh, the European regulation creates a playing field where entrepreneurs can strive and I have the even more dream that entrepreneurs stand up and, and are not attacking the fifth um, e-commerce shop, the seventh uh, online blog, but they really start creating the core and essential cornerstones of the future. Everything in the future will be a computer. And if we don't create the systems that operate these computers, we have no control about anything. We're simply not participating in the future. That's Verma. my dream. I know that Amazon is uh, also in space exploitation. Now, what is no? Now, then you will be very soon. What is the next moonshot, which can capture our imagination, which can uh, see that uh, the internet is a force for good? Is there something in the drawers like this, where uh, both sides of the Atlantic we can dream again and try to do it? We are notoriously secretive about those kind of things. <laughs> we will surprise you. Just as that Alexa surprised everyone when we brought it out into the market, um, there's, there's enough surprises for you to coming down. If there is one dream I do have, and I think it is sort of more call to action for everybody here, um, the free flow of data proposal has gone out for consultation from the EU. That means that each and everyone in this room can actually contribute your ideas to this consultation. Go to the uh, European Commission website, look for a free flow of data, actually look at the proposals that are there, and give your feedback. This is extremely important. If you want to break down the barriers between countries, because remember, you, you mentioned earlier these walls. These walls are illusions. There are no real walls in a digital world. Um, I actually want to use the words there from one of your uh, successors there, Needy Cruz, who said that, um, you know, in these cases, you know, with all these regulations, 
with, against all of these mechanisms, they don't really matter. If someone's breaking into your house, you don't need a good lawyer, you need a good lock. <laughs> Yeah, and so with all of this, we need to focus on how can we protect our customers at the technology level with technology principles so that they have control themselves over this and don't need to rely on sort of regulations by the government who are way beyond, way behind or driven by emotions that have nothing to do with, uh, the, current, with the reality. Well, I believe that internet can be emotions. So uh, we, I think it, we have to move away from these technicalities and show that internet is there for the people, for the people to create, for the people who do. And I'm sure I give the last word to you, uh, Willem, because I think that in the whole research, this is something also which has shown very strongly. Yeah, to, to, to end with a positive note, because I, I think I'm very positive. It's, it's, it's human capital, if I see the uh, young entrepreneurs, if I see the students in our education programs, they are full of energy, they're discovering the world, and they are, I mean, having a startup is like having a music band when I was young. So it's, it's, it's really something that gives them energy, they go for it, and they drive it. I think coming to Europe, I see three areas where Europe can really have a leading role. So the first one we discussed already, car industry. I was with Philips for a long time, and we lost the battle in consumer electronics because vacuum disappeared from the TV screen. What's happening in the car industry, the combustion engine is disappearing from the powertrain. That will remove a barrier to entry, which is enormous. So be aware, be awake. The other area, I think digital industry, the digitization of our industry, especially here in Germany, I mean, made in Germany, you have a real big advantage, but do it right and adopt the information technology fast. And the final thing, I think healthcare. We have a healthcare system in Europe that is unmatched in the US, and I think uh, the next government will do something to make it even better in the US, if I understood uh, very well. So, I, I mean, we have our assets, we have our values, and technology is not free of values. So let's take up those values and build on that, and they will be respected in the rest of the world as well, because, again, it's a global business. So made in Europe, for the world, and now the band, because an inventor. And now we do the music. Yeah, right? <laughs> 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 <laughs>